Welcome to Intermittent Signal. I'm David A. Westbrook. This is episode number 13, Getting Through Security, Part 3. An introduction to this project is available in episode 11. If you want to read, rather than listen, McGuire and Westbrook, Getting Through Security, Counterterrorism, Bureaucracy, and a Sense of the Modern is published by Routledge and widely available. Today's podcast is Part 1, Chapter 2, The Horizon of Fear. Security disorients contemporary thought across a range of present situations. Much like the unattainable horizon, nonetheless encompasses a sailor. This book addresses security in the familiar and perhaps paradigmatic sense of the f- physical security of individuals in public places, like airports, but also schools, houses of worship, shopping malls, trains, and bridges in London that operate under the specter of armed attack. The concept of armed attack is also vague but familiar, encompassing forms of violence often called terrorism and casually distinguishable from both wars and crimes. Protecting public spaces from armed attack, however, is hardly the only enterprise structured by some notion of security. Consider computer security, another sort of critical infrastructure. While historically recent and ideologically legitimated by a rosy future, innovation The process of digitizing operations is now several human and many more machine generations old. Code, code, meanwhile, has become a space of innocence circled by threats. Flash crashes happen, and sometimes airplanes crash, too. Perhaps unsurprisingly for a digital era, the perennial conflicts among nations, between institutions, and over property are also conducted online. Efforts to ensure digital security have grown apace, and many of the more philosophical aspects of this book could equally well have been situated in the adversarial evolution in cyberspace, rather than the games of castles and cannons played in airports. Or finance. Way back in the 1970s, Herstadt, a fairly obscure German private bank, suddenly stopped settling its transactions. Only then did it emerge that much larger and better known financial institutions in several different countries were exposed to Herstadt in the relatively short term and were unable to cover their own positions. Due to the opacity of the matter, these same institutions were temporarily denied credit and were at risk of collapse. Similar things had happened before, for example the failure of the Knickerbocker Trust and the ensuing Panic of 1907, and would happen again for example, the implosion of long-term capital management in 1998, but until the global financial crisis, Herstadt risk remained an arcane worry. Now we speak more broadly of systemically significant institutions, argue over past causes, and worry if, when, and how such a risk might emerge next, like an iceberg out of the fog of proprietary and often instantaneous transactions, and titanic institutions have no time to turn. Or one day, there is an outbreak of something odd, frequently a new strain of something common, a statistically implausible number of people in a seemingly random hotspot sicken and some die, and the hunt is on for a pathogen and its vectors of distribution, beating a path back through the bewildering network of global food production, with grain, meat, fruit, and vegetables shipped from one continent to another, and distributed through a tangled web, but maybe it is not food contaminated by the runoff from a feedlot, but instead an errant traveler who picked up a disease somewhere, perhaps at a wet market, and brought it somewhere else, and so on. And there may be no drugs, or the drugs do not work, now that microbes the world over are fed a steady diet of once efficacious antibiotics. Such stories are literally true, but they also serve as parables for global society, or a constellation of societies, if that seems better, where networks almost always function just fine, albeit under continuous threat of dramatic disturbance, with potentially catastrophic losses in blood and treasure. As always, poor people in general suffer more, and some socially-minded scholars and activists speak of the global precariat, people whose insecure status evidently defines them. One might go on, but there is no need. The point is that narratives of security run through present situations based on the specific facts of different settings, resulting in variances of thought and action, but nonetheless recognizable as a species of the same genus. It would be nice to define the genus, at least, but the concept of security mocks the rationalist impulse to order a disquisition by first defining terms. From a historical perspective, security has denoted different things during different eras, In ancient times, it referred to the philosophical search for inner serenity, 
Specifically, in ancient Rome, the term security meant securitas, the spiritual state of not caring despite the chaos around. For Stoics, a, the purpose of philosophy was to find such serenity. Later, there was security in the sense of Pax, the peace of empire on earth before the end of days. Then came the security brought by the state. Hobbes, Locke, and later Weber described this. We still live in this normative world, Weber's monopoly of the legitimate use of force upon a territory. But today we also have the explosion of the use of the term security. Today everything must have security, from airports to the milk supply, and now security is a light motif of the contemporary. Security has become a preferred term when discussing a multitude of important global issues, even in settings where other terms were used in the recent past. Security addresses, without specifying, a range of concerns endemic to bureaucracies of various sorts, as excellence also seems to do. Writing in the closing years of the Cold War, scholars observed the rise of elusive security discourses and practices as the international and institutional order flexed in response to an increasingly interconnected world. They foresaw security attaching itself to the concerns of governments, populations, and individual persons, gaining biopolitical strength from life itself. But it would be naive to ask what this security was on its own terms. The search for a theory of security, according to the founders of security studies, is the search for an essentially contested concept, which should be left capaciously vague. Like art, justice, freedom, or even consciousness, security is always contested because it involves value judgment without an agreed measure for either value or judgment. One person's human security is another person's oppressive state apparatus. Seen ethnographically, however, words like security are not so much essentially contested concepts as scenes of discourse. Security does a lot of work in many present situations. For the ethnographer, then, security presents a problem in the sense of intellectual challenge, task, or even opportunity, rather than obstacle. So, without aspiring to rigorous definition, what do people mean, in general, when they talk about security? As seen suggests, security entails a context, which can be a physical space like an airport, or a set of con connected financial institutions, or a computer network, or the habitat of a microbe. Regardless of how it is constructed, security characterizes a space wherein inhabitants expect to operate peaceably, ordinarily, with little thought of danger, but such expectations may be violently disrupted. The bomb may go off, the bank may fail, the virus could spread. The space may no longer be safe, and that quality known as security may be lost. Space need not be secure. Across medieval Europe, over many centuries, the idea and eventually custom emerged that peace was the norm, as in King's Peace, Landfrieden, or the various truces said to be ordained by God, whether or not there was a king in power. Kings began by decreeing a peace in their immediate vicinity, and in other areas of particular importance to the crown, such as highways. In England, for a few centuries, the king's peace died with him, to be redeclared, or not, by his successor. But by their very declaration, such pieces expressed their limited scope and even novelty. Peace was ensured by effective authority. Such authority was hardly omnipresent. Outside the realm of the king's peace, one had no reason to expect security. One might rely on one's own prowess or the morality of others, and much was in God's hands. Those things said, this world was not presumed to be, in the nature of things, safe. The king's peace was safe, as a matter of law at least, in this area, for this time, and only because the king so decreed. Gradually, the notion of peace was expanded in both time and space. In England, for example, Edward I made the king's peace perpetual. Justices of the peace were established by Parliament in 1327. Similar developments occurred throughout the continent under royal or church auspices. Peace may thus be seen as concomitant with the rise of the state and law in much the sense we use it today. Put differently, it is not so far from the idea of the king's peace to Weber's famous definition of the state as the entity which has a monopoly of legitimate force upon a territory, which we discuss later. For now, however, it suffices to note that the idea of security also entails the idea of a ruler. Someone must assert sovereignty, 
must govern the space, whether as a bank regulator or a webmaster. That is, security is a good which is provided, not merely the absence of harm. An analogy might be made to health care. In modern societies, fostering health, for example, through sanitation and vaccination, and ameliorating ill health are understood to be obligations of the state. Being sick is a failure of government, not merely bad fortune. By the same token, a breach of security is a failure of authority to be effective, even an insult to the sovereign, a proposition to which we shall return. Since the Enlightenment, government styles itself as rational and operates through bureaucracy. In most contexts, security is a bureaucratic responsibility, though the bureaucracy need not be formally part of the state and need not be publicly legitimated. Financial institutions employ any number of compliance officers. Data security is part of every company's business. In the course of this book, officials may be elected, career government service, military, supranational, contractors, corporate, leviathan, and the code of many colors. But regardless of the precise legal status, the suicide bomber, or the propagating virus, is always also an official failure. Combining the fear of failure with bureaucratic rationality, we see official efforts to control spaces, to regulate movement, and above all, to surveil, to dictate the patterns of interaction within the space so that nothing can go wrong. We see CCTV on every corner, data monitoring, metal detectors here and yon. Fear has its political uses. Enemies, Carl Schmitt famously overstates in the concept of the political, are the a priori of politics. And security is better than a named enemy. Security is a horizon. There is no end to security concerns, no end to the enemies that may be imagined. Which is not to say that there are no enemies, but it is to say that the logic of security is in principle totalitarian. One need only recall the Red Scare, McCarthyism, and the paranoid style. The recent Gulf War was fought on the pretext of weapons of mass destruction held by Saddam Hussein, who indeed wanted them. The presumption of such weapons by both heads of state justified violence. Saddam appears to have been so fearsome that his own lieutenants deceived him about their failure to acquire such weapons, totalizing logics wrapped around one another like snakes. Thus the fear, real or merely paranoid, of the state can lead to the overextension of the state beyond the bounds of human decency, one way to read Macbeth in much of 20th century history. In this light, it makes some sense for individuals to confront the state with fear, perhaps the intense and disabling fear that in normal circumstances we would diagnose as paranoia. But what are normal circumstances? How far are we, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in China, even in Ecuador, from the surveillance state imagined by Orwell in 1984? Insofar as this or that contemporary state is not, in fact, totalitarian, to what extent is that the result of its incompetence rather than virtuous intentions or sound institutions? As Walter Kern more recently suggested, the paranoia that ranges across the U.S. West is a sort of folklore response, a report from the zeitgeist, to a state whose powers are enormous and unaccountable, indeed only suspected. Perhaps the black helicopters will not come, but look at what has happened so far. Fear may be justified. The Soviet Union did in fact slaughter millions of its own, preach world domination, and arm itself with horrific weapons. The United States adopted policies of assassination and torture. States have become totalitarian in deed, and sometimes even in word. The Twin Towers actually fell, which presumably many other people doubted in odd moments, as one momentarily disbelieves the loss of a loved one. Marauding shooters go to the mall, or kill in schools. There is no need to multiply examples, and it bears remembering that, statistically speaking, individuals are dying at historically low rates. Society thus presents an epistemological problem. On the one hand, the state's fear of some adversary, or the citizen's fear of the state, may be more or less justified in a given case. But on the other, the logic of security has a life of its own, and can lead to the paranoia of both governments and citizens. The U.S. government may invade Iraq in the name of freedom and our way of life, even as wealthy, mostly liberal, Californians acquire safe rooms 
and missile silos converted to swank bunkers, by motorcycles to escape the gridlock of the panic, and stockpile ammunition. All of this may be wrong, even crazy, but it has its own logic, paranoia within reason. In this book, we consider the paranoia within reason of those who must manage security in public spaces and, come the day, respond to violence, and do it again under different circumstances. How different? Tomorrow and the day after, the horizon recedes. Studying the security of public spaces requires a degree of sympathy for the devil, that is, the state. At least as a theoretical possibility, one might understand the state to be the greatest repressive entity in human affairs, Nietzsche's coldest of all cold monsters. Critique, in this view, would involve unmasking the nefarious workings of power by documenting the impact of some state action on the poor and suffering and or theorizing it, that is, renaming the state's activity in the critical post-structural language of certain precincts of the academy. From this unsympathetic stance, however, it would be difficult to do field work. Measures undertaken in the name of security would be understood as ritual expressions used to solidify power and hence concretize the state itself. The job of the critic would be to call such things out for what they are, that is, to oppose the state. Not incidentally, such opposition provides a role for the scholar, who is no longer a scholar of security as such. After all, the project proceeds on the assumption that the concept of security has already been unmasked, revealed to be something else, that is, a rhetorical device for the machinations of the state. Thus the critic presents as a sort of political actor common in the academy. While speaking truth to power might be praised as exemplary critique, critical thinking about security is such, by which we mean knowing how security unfolds in a given scene, staking out a position accordingly, would be retarded, if not abandoned altogether. Here we offer a more sympathetic, if by no means completely forgiving, view of how security is pursued in critical infrastructure. Perhaps unsurprisingly, security work is volumetric, layered, future-oriented, with multiple overlapping meanings, many of which address core understandings of the contemporary itself. No doubt, officials have their prejudices and other failings, but they often also confront real problems. As a society, we justifiably expect, and officials also expect of themselves, that the state, more precisely various aspects of the social with capabilities and authority, will do something about threats, not merely put on a show. Perhaps this expectation is somewhat old-fashioned. Maybe security is a rather coastal bourgeois concept, already beginning to fade from the scene. Security is very expensive, and taxes are high. Public spaces have not always been safe. In much of the world, the state makes few pretensions at being effective. Even societies in which states claim great responsibility for social welfare, Norway, France, Japan, suffer terrorist attacks. People who really want security usually buy it for themselves and their friends and family. Gate the neighborhood, fortify the compound, harden the car. Even in the developed world, those with real power seem to be abdicating, no longer flying commercial among their far-flung enclaves. Manhattan's new condominiums resemble those in Dubai, turned inward on themselves, away from the street with its less high net worth and potentially dangerous people. Soon enough, the rich may give up on the idea of civic, as opposed to private, space altogether. Government's obligation to provide security to the people is hardly a natural law. Just the opposite, in fact. Maybe social scientists ought to be sympathetic, at least sometimes, to those who quaintly try to protect the lowly citizen. But all the sympathy in the world, to say nothing of the data collected from CCTV and internet snooping and the like, will not solve the epistemological problem at the heart of paranoia within reason. While the official incentive to collect data is understandable, and much may be prevented, security writ large resists solution. Security is often treated as a problem that the powers that be are expected to solve, but this is a category mistake. Security cannot be solved any more than management or education can be solved. Why? Security is both very general and yet requires specification and hence imagination of a threat. 
Subsequent chapters will provide more detail, but for present purposes, let us start from the proposition that security is a negative and rather abstract notion. We expect security, violence to not break out. But it is difficult to prove a negative. We cannot apprehend security as such. We may hope, assume, and even think that no violence is about to erupt, that the killer is not pulling up to the door, but killers often arrive unannounced. Places are safe until they are not. Is the nearest airport safe right now? If there is an attack in the next few hours, then we shall come to know that the airport was not safe. Even if a security expert could find flaws in an airport's protective systems, chinks in its armor, the attack mostly does not come, and we might just deem the airport safe until such time as disaster happens. That is, security, like education or management, includes the future in the present, but the future is uncertain. Security thus entails uncertainty. Security cannot be fully known or solved. While security is a general and collective notion of an ill-defined set of bad possibilities, none will happen. Risk is a far more specific concept. The odds of a specific event, X, happening within a Y time frame are Z. Attempting to provide security writ large tends to slide into the more tractable problem of assessing and responding to specific risks. To say that this place is safe implicitly answers prior, often unstated, questions about specific futures. Safe for what? Safe from what? For how long? For example, security professionals are currently worried about active shooters and landside security in airports. Active shooters are a sensible concern, but since the future has not happened yet, such specific worries are more or less speculative. Security is a placeholder, a floating signifier, filled from time to time and place to place with anxieties about what might happen. Facts are indispensable, but security ultimately happens on the terrain of imagination, and many things may be imagined. Many things can be imagined for the simple reason that they have happened at another time and usually another place. There was a terrorist who did this, and there might be another. What can be done to prevent or neutralize this now specified threat? As is often said, a great deal of security work consists of closing the barn door after the horse has left. But the barn is dark inside, and perhaps there are other horses. People, and especially institutions, would be foolish not to learn from history. Attention to past disasters, however, teaches an even darker lesson. The participants did not imagine the crisis in advance, or else the danger would have been avoided or at least addressed differently. Instead, the participants understood belatedly, if at all, as the crisis unfolded or after the fact, and perhaps even now do not understand. Looking to our own security, how do we know what lies just over the horizon? The 9-11 report spoke of a failure of imagination, which is true, but like many truths, easily oversimplified. Neither individuals nor institutions are omniscient, have any real sense of all they do not know, what is yet to be invented. The question is, what should have been anticipated? Unimagined things, unknown unknowns, sometimes happen anyway. Security failures are obvious in the event, but whether or not something is secure, really secure, cannot be known. It is impossible to think security as such, full stop. Failures may be ameliorated and analyzed, and specific risks may be hypothesized and planned for, but these are partial approaches to security, not security itself. Thus, security is not definable not just because it is a contested concept, as discussed. Even were various users of security somehow to reach consensus upon the values at stake, and agree on how to judge the complexities that arise in virtually any security situation. 
The uncertainty of the future, of the threat not yet imagined, much less executed, would remain. The wisdom of a crowd in agreement is not the truth. The obligation to provide security thus becomes a horizon, an infinite regress, an invitation to ceaseless, anxious thought. Such paranoia within reason is both psychologically and institutionally almost unbearable, and both individuals and organizations turn to tactics, hence the secret college discussed in the next chapter. This has been Getting Through Security, Counterterrorism, Bureaucracy, and a Sense of the Modern, Part 3, on Intermittent Signal. Music written, performed, and produced by Vince Parlato. I'm David Westbrook. Until next time, be well.